Hello and welcome to this week's Convex Conversation with me, journalist Helen Fospero. Normally we feature one guest, but today, who knows who will drop in? I suspect former US President Donald Trump will make an appearance, Boris Johnson's assert, and maybe even John Cleese or Sir David Attenborough. One thing's for sure, it's going to be a fun and interesting ride with the nation's much-loved satirical impressionist and huge favourite of mine, Rory Bremner. Hello, Rory. How the devil are you? I'm fine, actually, thank you. Yes, I, I had uh, my little brush with COVID, but I think that was partly with, with character research. I thought since Boris, as you mentioned, and Trump, as you mentioned, since they both had it, I thought I'll try this and see what it's like. But thankfully, and uh, with great relief, it was a very, very mild and almost asymptomatic, although I did lose my sense of humour. <laughs> not good. Yeah, because you lose, you know, they say about losing your sense of taste and smell and stuff, but I lost my sense of humour, but it might have been something to do with it. it happened around about the time that they ransacked the Capitol building in Washington and the COVID figures were looking very bad. And it's been actually, I was talking to Andy Zaltzman, who does the news quiz, and he was saying, you know, it is kind of bizarrely underneath the door. It's, it's been, it's not been a terribly funny time. Certainly the last month, I mean, it's been a grim old time, hasn't it, so far this year. January has been grey, it's been cold, and we've been locked up. So what's to like. It has been a grim old time and we are locked up, but maybe extra grim for you. Are you mourning the loss of Donald <laughs> well, Trump? The, I don't think you say it's in the sense of I miss him like I miss measles or COVID indeed. You know, sense, of course, because he was such a grotesque. Uh, I was a big character, you know, the biggest. I was the only one that mattered. Helen, I was very, very big. But of course, I mean, they always said about political jokes, the trouble is with political jokes is they get elected. <laughs> and he did. And he was just, it's lovely to talk about him in the past tense. For a little while between the inauguration of Biden and the trial, it went kind of quiet and you didn't have this kind of monster coming out. You thought, oh, what's he coming out with this week? I mean, but it started right at the very beginning, even before he became president, when uh, I think the first person to call him was El Sisi from Egypt. And they said, oh, Mr. Trump, president of Egypt. And he picked up the phone to the president of Egypt. And the first words he said to a foreign leader was, I love the bangles. I love the bangles. You know, that song works like an Egyptian. And that was kind of, the, and then we get to the inauguration and George W. Bush left the stage with Hillary Clinton after the inauguration speech. And George W. Bush, who, by the way, I mean, Trump makes Bush look like Abraham Lincoln. But anyway, he was leaving the stage and he said, and I, I heard this from a journalist who interviewed Hillary Clinton, and George W. Bush turned to her after the speech and said, that was some fairly weird stuff. But he didn't say fairly, he said another F word. And he didn't say stuff, he said another <laughs> Uh, S word. So that was some, yeah, fill in the gaps. That was some fricking weird stuff. And that was, Bush. and so that's what we were going to get. And of course, within hours, they were saying it's the greatest number of people ever at an inauguration. I think, no, it wasn't. I mean, you just have to look at the photographs. And his press spokesman said, well, that's what it is. And his Kellyanne Conway said, uh, that we're just giving you alternative facts. And we lived with alternative facts in the last four years, 30,000 of them. He came out with 30,000 false claims or misleading uh, claims or outright lies. And, and But the problem is it, it became our problem, his bad behavior. It was like a cat arriving at Crufts. And people say, oh, this is a dog show. And he goes, so? I'm here now. I'm here now. And it's your problem. You're going to have to fix it. So he was kind of an aberration. I can see where he came from, though. I mean, I can see how it happened. Rather, I, I can see how Boris and Brexit happened. And I get it. I understand that. But, you know, these people should not be within a mile. I mean, that he was, you know, on any personality basis. And he, he just kept crashing through rules like roadblocks. And of course, 74 million people voted for him. The second most, luckily, the second most uh, that have ever voted because Biden, of course, got, got the most. So there is a phenomenon here that you have to deal with. And there's something that we have to understand about the way the world has gone and the divisions that exist, which are kind of exacerbated by social media. But we are very tribal. Yeah, it's, it's, it'll be a while to get over Trump, I think. I think I might have what they call it long Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we don't get long Trump on our it's podcast. Keep coming back. Yeah, that would be really bad. And uh, of course, we've now got President Biden at the White House. Um, hopefully a much safer pair of hands, one would hope. What does he bring to the table in terms of a character for you to impersonate? Well, I was uh, just talking to your, to your husband about who's American, uh, about, you know, where where the accent come from. And it's, you know, it's a, it, well, the voice 
voice comes from a different part from because uh, you know his his voice comes from a different part well of his anatomy from Trump so I think we know where, <laughs> where where Trump's voice came from but but so and it's you know it's got a hard edge to it he talks about it. it's going to be hard we're going to have to bring the country together it's going to be hard but I think you know it's going to be I hope it's going to be a, a return to boring because I think we need a little bit of boring in politics at the moment I mean everyone is getting so worked up and so angry and. Do you remember the beaching cuts where these railway lines uh, were sort of chopped in the, I think it was the 1950s, wasn't it? I do, I do. And there were all sorts of stations between calm and angry, okay? People now say, I'm really angry about this. I'm really angry. I think, well, hang on, there's lots of stops. You could be disappointed. You could be frustrated. You could be irritated. You know, all these things. But now people, it's, it's straight to anger. And I don't know how we're going to calm this down, really. I mean, there are reasons, of course, to be frustrated and reasons to be disappointed but it comes out in anger it comes out this opposition and I mentioned in social media but you know social media and you know to some extent you know radios they, they've monetized anger they've monetized division because the, all the algorithms basically work around fear and anger so I don't know but so a, a, a kind of return to something kind of vaguely managerial and, and technocratic and quiet and boring is going to be I think I quite like that. Then I can spend more time watching cricket. <laughs> Over the years, our various politicians and leaders have been a rich seam, rich yes. Team. And I'm of course, rich once. <laughs> of course, Boris must be a real gift, actually. How do you feel that he's handled oh, the well, pandemic? No, 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 and well, yeah, 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 it's very nice. And it's a shame I can't see you because you sound very lovely. No, but I, I, I yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I don't know where we start. I mean, I still get over the idea that when they, when they say Prime Minister Boris Johnson, I still kind of go, what? You know, it's one of the, those words don't belong together. It's like social worker Jacob Rees-Mogg or <laughs> maths teacher Diane Abbott or <laughs> Rabbi Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Something just kind of wrong about it, uh, uh, but I, yeah, yeah, hi, 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 hi. And I've been doing these uh, a little some some tweets uh, recently. Uh, I call them my Captain Corona, Captain Corona uh, tweets. And I, I say about what a great job we are doing. We're going to do. We're doing great. Uh, great. And I've done everything. I've done everything, Helen, that I possibly uh, could, except shut down earlier. Everything I could except shut down earlier and, and protect the care homes. Uh, everything I could except, except shut down earlier, uh, protect the care homes. Go to, go to five, uh, uh, COBRA meetings about, about COVID. Uh, and uh, yes, and organize school exams. Yes. Well, okay. Let's, let's, let's change. Oh, look, a puffin. Um, <laughs> I, but, like, but let us, let, I mean, this is not, this is not easy. It is not easy. It is not easy. I mean, you can either, on the one hand, you can, you can, you know, let the virus rip. Uh, and risk uh, hundreds of uh, tens of thousands of deaths, or or you can you can destroy your economy. But I think I think we've managed to 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 do both. And I think it's quite an achievement. He's extraordinary in in his own way, and it's rather like you know. I remember it was my birthday when I was on doing a birthday Zoom call, and this thing came up saying Boris Johnson has been admitted to intensive care. And I thought this is you know we're living in this box set world, and and writers had come up with another twist, and then he managed to survive, thankfully, and. Straight after that, you know, the baby was born, and this is just the most extraordinary world that we are we are living with. But I, I, I think we are now. I'm, and of course, I'm a father again, a father for the. Uh, I'm, I'm now a father of. Um, hang on, I, 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 I just, just hang on. Is it? Um, is it six? Is it seven? I think. I think it, it might be six. It might be seven. I don't know. Uh, I think my personal R, my reproduction number, my personal R is is I think it's I think it's about I think it's about seven. So for every one of me, I have reproduced um, another another set. But it may be it may be more. So if you've come into contact with me uh, in the in the last uh, ten years and have a child, uh, I, I get a test. Get a test. That's what I, I, I suggest. So yeah. So that's what we're dealing with. And yes, he's a big character. I'm not sure he has the skill set for this particular job. As somebody said, I don't think he, he wanted to be prime minister. He wanted to have been prime minister. Both his premiership and the coronavirus and, in, in fact, Brexit, you know, are classic examples of be very careful what you wish for. Because he and Michael Gove the morning after Brexit looked a little like those, you know, the two people in the producers. They woke up and they realised that what they thought was going to be a spectacular failure has, in fact, become a glorious success. And we're looking at those consequences. And actually, one has helped the other because I think, you know, if it weren't for coronavirus, I think a lot of the last few weeks uh, of 
Brexit at the beginning of this year would have been making the headlines. And it's not looking good if you're a, if you're a fisherman or a haulier or run a business or have a textile firm. Now, you've been, Rory, in the headlines quite a lot recently, thanks to the National Archives <laughs> being released from the early 90s and your spoof John Major calls, which have so entertained me on Twitter. For those who have um, been locked in a cupboard for the last couple of weeks, tell us the story in, in your words of those calls. <laughs> I love hearing the words John Major again, because I, I, I have a certain affection for the, those times. Well, yeah, I mean, this goes back uh, 1993, it happened, if you if I can take you back. So John Major was Prime Minister. We were just starting a series at Channel 4 and thinking, how can we kind of push the boundaries? What can we do that um, you know, is going to make this series satirical and a little bit more edgy? And we thought, well, OK, well, should we do some hoax calls, some spoof calls? And at that time, if your listeners can relate to this, that there were a bunch of backbenchers who were giving the Conservative Prime Minister a very hard time over Europe. They were a small group that John Major called the, the bastards in a, an off mic moment with Michael Brunson from ITN. And so yet the Eurosceptic bastards were, I mean, people like John Redwood and others and so on. But anyway, so we thought, okay, well, why don't I ring them up? pretending to be John Major and give them a hard time. So we got some phone numbers and Major was in Malaysia at the time doing some foreign trip. So John Fortune rang up and said, uh, oh, Mr. Carlyle, I've got the Prime Minister. Oh, put him, put him through. And I spoke to John Carlyle, but the, the recording didn't work. So having done it, I then had to go and do it again with a new guy called Richard Boddy. And so Richard Boddy, uh, who's an MP for somewhere in East Anglia somewhere, and said, now, come on, Richard, I want to know what you've been saying behind my back. And he sort of shuffled a little bit, oh, like, well, I, I, mean, I mean, try to support you. Well, you've got a funny way of showing it, Richard, if I may say so. So this conversation, we hadn't scripted it, so I had to make it up. So we were saying things like, I want, you, I want you to come to the conference, which is happening the next week, and I want you to dance with me on the last night. And he said, well, no, no, all, all right, I will. Okay. And so we ended the call, and we thought, what are we going to do with that? And after a few days, we realised we couldn't air it without his permission. But also we were getting a little bit of kickback of sort of saying, well, hang on, you've, you've sort of set alarm bells ringing. And a couple of years later, I met the cabinet secretary, Robin Butler, who said, yes, well, we thought, you know, we, we, we got word back. People saying, oh, yes, I've spoken to the prime minister. And we knew they hadn't spoken to the prime minister. So we thought, well, hang on, we've got to do something about this because you could ring up the chancellor and you could get the budget secrets, all the rest of it. But what I didn't know and came out just a couple of weeks ago when they released the files from 1993, was I knew we'd put the cat amongst the pigeons, but I didn't know what the pigeons had been up to. And the pigeons, the people I've been speaking to, they were going to give John Major hell in the run-up to the party conference. But because this guy, Richard Boddy, had spoken to the Prime Minister, or thought he'd spoken to the Prime Minister, he rang round and he called it off. And he said, he said no, I've spoken to, to the Prime Minister, and I, and I you know, so we, I've, I've, I've told us to back off. And so when the Cabinet Secretary said, no, no, it wasn't John Major, he said, oh, don't be so ridiculous. He said, I, I, I think I'd know. He said, and if he's going to deny it, he goes down in my estimation because that call has saved his bacon. And so, yeah, so they called off this rebellion that they were going to have in the run up to the conference uh, and they so gave him a free reign. And all the archives just talk about trying to convince this MP that he hadn't spoken to John Major when he thought he had. So I didn't actually stop Brexit, but I might have kind of I might have slowed it down. When did John Major know what, what you'd done? And also, she says, being prof unprofessional and wrapping another question into that. What does he think to your impression of him? <laughs> well, I think he I think he was a little bit sensitive about it. I met him because we have a shared love of cricket. And he was a little bit wary in the early days because he was sometimes a little bit thin skinned. I think he, he didn't didn't really like the impression very much. I used to have a, a sort of John Major kind of riff. What was it? They said it couldn't be done. It wasn't. They said I wasn't up to the job. I'm not, but I'm still here. So he didn't particularly like that very much. But later he wrote his autobiography, or someone wrote his autobiography, and it does refer to that, and he's kind of enjoyed the incident. He said, but it wasn't me. It, it turned out to be that young wag, Rory Bremner. So I'm, I'm a young wag, clearly. So I think he enjoyed that. And one of the documents that I've got in front of me, actually, it's a little, it's a memo that was written. This is what they get in their red box. So you get a little glimpse as to what happens behind the scenes, because obviously the cabinet secretary had to keep Major informed on these hoax calls. So there are pages of transcripts of him talking to the MPs concerned and establishing when it was. And George Richard Body said, well, it, I think it was about four o'clock because I was enjoying a pot of tea with my wife, which doesn't happen very often. 
But there's one little note which says Richard Bonney telephoned to apologise to the Cabinet Secretary for not believing him when we said it wasn't John Major. He didn't seem too upset. And at the top, there's two little ticks and I can see John Major's writing and he's just put, good. So, <laughs> but I imagine in amongst all the other documents about Maastricht and Europe and, I don't know, nuclear war in China or something like that, this probably came as some light relief. Really. <sighs> but, but for me, it was an object lesson in however satirical or crazy or ridiculous you think you're being, real life has a habit of trumping all that, and literally <laughs> trumping all that in the case of America. But even back then, we didn't know the half of it. It's like Bird and Fortune when they did their stuff about Iraq. And they found out John Bird rang an old university friend who was working in the Ministry of Defence, I think, and said, is this true that not only have we armed Saddam Hussein, but we've actually lent him the money to buy the weapons with? And this guy said, oh, yes, 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 it's perfectly true. It's it's all part of the fog of hypocrisy that surrounds this place. And John Bird and John Fortune had a wonderful sort of 10 years or so working with this material where all they had to do was to present it in the form of an interview. People would be crying with laughter at the fact that what was actually happening in real life was more ridiculous than you could possibly imagine. I loved you back in the old days. I mean, you mentioned Bird and Fortune, but, you know, it was Bremner Bird and Fortune, wasn't it, on <laughs> Channel 4? And I've dug through the archives and we found a little clip of you. Should we have a listen? Ooh. So Tony Blair zooms back to London and straight away visits the Queen. And you think, well, obviously he's keen to get back to work as soon as possible. Not a bit of it. The reason was that the Queen had a horse running in the Oaks and wanted to watch it. <laughs> Hello, who? Hey, <laughs> oh, I thought you were gone. Today, um, well, oh, can, can it wait? Um, or oh, couldn't you email me? <laughs> hey, well, I suppose if it has to be in person, um, I'll be in Ladbrokes in half an hour. It was groundbreaking stuff, wasn't it, Rory? And was it enormous fun for you to be involved in? Well, that makes me laugh, actually. I haven't kind of forgotten all that. Yes, it was. I mean, there was, it was the time of my life, really, because, I mean, there we were. I mean, the great thing, Channel 4 trusted us. They let us get on with it, so there wasn't sort of any interference. And, I mean, it was it was seat of the pants stuff. I mean, I would go in on a Monday morning with Jeff, my producer, Jeff Atkinson, and we would sort of look at each other, and we would have to map out the show in like an hour on a Monday morning. And the team would be arriving. I could see them out of the door as Jeff and I were speaking. The director and the set people and the costume people and the makeup people, they're all arriving for their Monday morning meeting when they were going to be told what we were doing that week. So Jeff and I really, we had to decide, we had to, we could do about six or seven characters. So we would do four or five characters on the Wednesday and then on the Thursday, maybe do another two or so. So we had to think, right, which six characters are we going to do this week? And I remember after the panorama interview with Diana, I remember Jeff coming in and I was thinking, I know what you're going to say. I know exactly what you And he said, yeah, how do you fancy doing Diana this week? And I thought, oh, here we go. So, you know, there were moments like that. Or otherwise we think, right, what are we going to do with Tony Blair this week? What are we going to do with George Bush this week or whatever? And then Jeff would go next door and tell them, right, we need a, a George Bush wig. We need a, a Queen wig. And the location people say, okay, we need to have one room that looks like Blair's office. We need to look, we need to have a room that looks a little bit like the White House and all those. Jeff and I would have two days to write the show. And I would, I would say, right, I've got to finish writing that sketch by 12 o'clock. They finish writing that sketch by two o'clock, whatever. So I spent Monday and Tuesday. Tuesday, my great friend, John Langdon, came in. He taught me everything about writing. He died last year. And I'll tell you more about him in a sec because he's quite a character. So he would come in and sort of we rewrite the sketches and we'd argue sometimes. We once argued for 40 minutes about whether to put A or V. <laughs> and eventually I gave in and I said, okay, I'll put A. And then when I recorded it, I did the anyway. <laughs> But then on, uh, so Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we go to a location just somewhere off the M25, big country house or something, which had a big staircase that could be the White House, a room that could be Blair's office, a swimming pool that could be Berlusconi's Bunga Bunga Palace or whatever. Spend the day filming there as four characters. Come back into London. Sometimes I'd get a motorbike from the location because I'd be doing an after dinner in London somewhere. So I literally would get a taxi bike up Thursday morning into a studio where I do the green screen things, you know, like the weather forecast or or anything that you have to have a green screen behind you and they can change the background. And often we get an interviewer like sometimes Jon Snow, Kirsty Young or Christian Gurmurthy or Kirsty Walk did it once to interview me as a character in makeup. Then we'd wrap, 
lunchtime on Thursday. I'd have Thursday afternoon and evening to sort of just crash out. Friday, we'd be in the studio, Wembley or Teddington. I'd have to write all the monologues. We'd have a few contributions from other writers and Jeff, the producer, and Bird and Fortune would come and sit in the dressing room. And I loved those times. They would have some thoughts about what had happened during the week. And I'd write the monologues. And then on Friday evening, perform them in front of the audience. And all the sketches that we'd done the previous days had been edited together and shown to the audience. And I just loved that because I don't think we doubted ourselves at that time. We had a wonderful team who would always go the extra mile because they believed in what we were doing. And it was always lovely to see the sketches come back from the previous day. It was like, you know, the best ever bunch of photos you could get coming back from the chemist, if you see what I mean. I absolutely loved it. And then it stopped 2010 and Channel 4 pulled the plug and we never quite found out why. But we were lucky. We had... 18 years, an incredible run. And we were lucky to know John Bird and John Fortune was just a dream. And John Langdon, I say, he taught me everything about writing. He's just an extraordinary guy. He put the scaffolding up and the flagpole on the wisp building in Leicester Square. He played balalaika and guitar. He was in a two-man sort of fake Russian duet called Bibs and Vanya. They played in Russia. They played at the Albert Hall. He was passionate. He, by the time he died, he collected 150 sewing machines. He had two boats on the Thames, but they never got into the Thames because he hadn't finished mending them. He wrote the sketch that got Derek Jameson into court and Derek Jameson sued the BBC and lost. He said, you know, he's a, the archetypal working class man made bad or something. East End boy made bad who thought that erudite was a type of glue, all that sort of stuff. Anyway, so he wrote that and he had a joke format named after him called The Langdon. And The Langdon for comedy writers who sort of kind of really know their stuff from the 70s and 80s. A Langdon, an example of Langdon would be Boris Johnson and his fiancée showed off their new puppy to the public the other day. He's totally out of control and keeps trying to hump everything that moves, said the dog. <laughs> okay, you know, so you take him in one of So, yeah, and he died uh, in March last year. It wasn't COVID, it was pre-COVID. He obviously had a great sense of timing. Unusually for him, because he was always so late. He was so late for me <laughs> with scripts that um, one of his producers actually got divorced because his wife didn't believe that all those late nights that her husband was actually working with John Langdon. She thought he must be having an affair. And anyway, the last email exchange that we had, the very last time, they crossed in the air with the same joke. So I'd written exactly the same joke as he had. And it was a joke for, I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. And it was... We had to come up with slogans, new slogans for companies, silly slogans for companies. And we'd both simultaneously come up with sussexroyal.com, air today, gone tomorrow. And that joke passed in the air, it landed in my inbox and it landed in his inbox. And it was just the most wonderful little bit of fate that that was the last exchange we had. And it was, as John used to say, you know, we were like an old married couple. We used, we finished each other's sandwiches. Oh, that's, God, that's made me feel quite choked up, actually. It's lovely that you've got all those memories, though, to look back on. And oh, I was how so, amazing. so lucky, Helen. I really was. You know, and even now, you know, we've lost quite a few people. Tim Brooke Taylor, who died last year, he did, I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. We did that tour uh, in January and he was dead by the end of March, I think. Jeremy Hardy, who died two years ago, the funniest guy. We shared a flat in London. He said, yes, I used to live in Rory's attic. That's why he looks so young. <laughs> he used to just wind up the producer of I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, who used to like wearing flowery shirts. So he'd walk on in front of the audience, the producer, and Jeremy would be sitting on the stage behind him in front of the audience. And the producer would walk on with a flowery shirt and Jeremy would go, nice blouse, John. <laughs> or, oh, someone's been to Laura Ashley. <laughs> Rural England is a really scary place. In my travels, I've been to most of the country, and by far the scariest part of it is Cornwall. <laughs> Don't be fooled by the painters and sculptors. Cornwall is a big place. It stretches almost to America, and the further you go, the weirder it gets. You go through the Wicker Man, through Straw Dogs, and eventually you're into an amateur production of Annie. And it's full of people who mistakenly went there for a quiet life because of crime in our big cities. In Cornwall, there is less mugging, more savage ritual murder. <laughs> Fewer stabbings, more smotherings. <laughs> Your baby appears to be left-handed, Mrs Trelawney. I wouldn't feed it if I were you. We were lucky because we did something we believed in and we were working with people who were just 
so funny and so warm and as a bird and fortune and include them in that and they taught me so so much can you give us an insight into the process of how you start off with somebody new and what triggers the voice for you oh well yeah i mean i i'm, I'm kind of i don't trust my ability as I used to, as much as I used to. I think partly it's because when you're younger, you're more fearless. I mean, whether you're a sportsman or a performer or wherever you've got, I think you've got, it's a mixture of kind of ambition and energy. I see it in younger performers now and I go, oh, goodness heavens, I, I don't think I could be that brave again. And it's the same with, with voices. I think it's, it helps if you've got a musical ear so you can pick up the rhythm and the sound of a voice and then the, the pitch of it. And then you've got to, so what part of the throat does it come from? Is it like a sort of the Roger Moore voice? Is, which, of course, was very deep. And so you had to go down there low. And do that. Or if it was a, a Nelson Mandela voice, which came from a different part of the throat altogether and was completely unique. Or if it was a, like an adenoidal voice, like Sir Melvin Bragg used to be. So you could hit, <clears throat> you'd say, so join us for In Our Time. I always think it should be called In Your Own Time, Melvin. But In Our Time today, we talk about... Elizabethan tapestries. <laughs> so he's got that adenoidal voice, which also actually Chris Tarrant has. <laughs> okay, so uh, is it going to be A? Is it going to be B? Uh, and so you've got that kind of uh, uh, going on with Chris Tarrant, which actually, if you mix it with Tony Blair, the weird thing is, what you get is Ed Miliband. And I think what, what I'd say to you, and I think, you know, I'll say to the people, I'm never going to give you up. I'm never going to let you down. I'm never going to turn around and desert you. And that's the words I put on the headstone. So... You know, you just have certain voices. Alistair McGowan calls them voice bunkers, where one voice is so close to another that you find yourself accidentally slipping from, from one voice. Like, I used to do Keith Floyd a lot. Keith Floyd, you remember, a lovely you know, TV chef, you're drinking all the time, all very jolly. And actually, that's a little bit similar to David Cameron. And I, I think, you know, you go a little bit higher. And you, you know, and I, I think there's a, little bit of, there's a little bit of Keith Floyd there. You know, and I, I, just, I just think it's important. And I think, I think it's that instant way of saying, I think, and you allied the two together and it sounds like a pig saying, oink, 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 it's going to be important. So you're aware instinctively of where voices come from. And I'm struggling because I haven't really been put under pressure to do Keir Starmer, for example, but I think it's the, again, he's got some, it comes from some strange, different place. Or I met Alan Rickman, I'm doing all these people who are dead now, Alan Rickman. But Alan Rickman, you know, he came again. He had a very distinctive voice because it came from a kind of unique place. Or, you know, you've got the voices that sound older than you, like John Cleese, who now sort of... Do you know, the funny thing is, I, when I... <laughs> but I, you know, I look out now and I, I have to put that sort of gravelly bit and people's voices changed, like David Attenborough when he was younger. When he was younger, we all used to say, here is... But now he's become a little bit more sibilant, as I say, uh, after two hours filming this extraordinary stick insect, we discover that it is, in fact, a stick. <laughs> so you learn where they come from, the accent. That's always good. You always want somebody with a rich accent, like, you know, maybe William Haig, because, of course, he sounded very distinctive. People have got to understand. People got to, if I played you a tape now of Jeremy Hunt, I suppose we're used to Jeremy Hunt, Matt Hancock, or somebody like that. You know, I'm not sure you would necessarily, although we've heard it quite a lot, would you know him as distinctively as, as if I played you Donald Trump, you know? Or if I played you Bill Clinton, you probably know that because you're used to hearing it. It's got to be a voice that people are familiar with. And then you start off being a little bit close to the voice because you're going for an accurate impression. And after a while, as was the case with Tony Blair or to some extent Trump or, or maybe Boris, they, they start to take on a character of their own. And you can be a little bit more, you can, you, can, you, can, you can have a lot of fun. You can have a lot of fun and you can inhabit that person. So you start with trying to get the voice right because obviously you've got to recognise it and you've got those five or six clues. The, what sort of accent does it go? What part of the th throat does it come from? Is it high? Is it low? All of those things. And then you have to add the material onto that. And then after a little while, if you've been doing that voice for quite a while and that character has developed and built, you can inhabit it and, and have a lot of fun. That was part one of my chat with Rory Bremner. In part two, I'm fully expecting His Royal Highness Prince Charles. And we hear from Rory how mimicking teachers at school led to his extraordinary career. 
Do subscribe and download the Convex Conversations series at convex.podbean.com or search for it on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, Pipped or Ask Alexa. I'll be back next week with more Rory and Friends. See you then.